going to focus mainly on controlling blood sugar uh, without medication. We're also going to spend some time talking about diabetes because when we talk about controlling blood sugar, we also talk about diabetes. We want to talk about preventing. Um, we're going to spend some time sharing uh, some statistics about diabetes, and then we're going to focus on everyone's favorite, food and activity. And that really is what it comes down to when we're talking about controlling blood sugars without medication. Okay? If you have any questions, uh, if you would just wait till the end, um, because there may be a chance that we may answer your questions throughout our presentation, and then we'd be more than happy to, you know, to answer them uh, towards the end. Okay. So <clears throat> tonight, when you get here, all of you should have <coughs> received a little gift bag, um, and in here are just some handy tools. There's a pen if you want to jot down any questions, by all means you can do that. Uh, there's probably some form of a magazine in there. It may not be this particular magazine, but there's, there's something in there. Uh, this is a guide to diabetes. Uh, we also have from the Sterling Park District, uh, we have their trail system. It's a map. It just it talks about some of the different uh, features. Um, <coughs> There's a few handouts in here. One is knowing your numbers. And we're going to talk about this a little bit tonight as far as hemoglobin A1C and what this means. You'll need a balanced meal. I kind of call this, um, like, does anyone remember Gur animals, the clothing line Gur animals where you can mix and match? Okay. So that's kind of what I, what I look at this. So if you're going to eat a protein, Here's your different proteins that you can eat, and John's going to focus more on that. Uh, carbohydrates, you know, those kind of things. So this is a very, very handy tool, very handy. There's also a recipe in here uh, for Greek yogurt dip. Um, you know, you can eat with, you know, fresh cut vegetables, uh, pita chips, you know, whatever you choose. But uh, this, is, this is a good dip. Roasted uh, Brussels sprouts with cranberries. Um, I, 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 oh, I see the noses already. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, I, you know what? I would agree. Boiled or steamed Brussels sprouts, not my favorite. But roasted Brussels sprouts with a little balsamic vinegar or I think the cranberries, they taste completely different. All right, I see a head shaker already. <laughs> so, anyway, some good recipes in here. Um, mini pumpkin tarts, and um, we also wanted uh, you folks to have a copy of the 2020 cholesterol and glucose screenings. So the schedule is listed here, um, locations. Um, I want to point out appointments are required, okay? So if this is something that you're going to participate in, make sure that you call and make an appointment. And here's also the blood pressure and blood sugar screenings. And this is a handout here. It's called, Where in the World Can I Walk? This is something that we use at the Diabetes Center. It has several locations listed in uh, the, the communities, um, addresses, contact information, and, and the distance on the hours uh, that are available. Some of these hours may be a little skewed. Some of them may have changed hours. If you're going to go walk at one of these facilities and you're not sure as far as opening time, just give them a call, see what times are available for you. And I love this. Little cubby board, eat your veggies. What more can I say? Okay, so if you did not receive one of these, Sherry, they can have some back there. Okay, okay. All right. All right, everybody's Brains, everybody's ready to go here. We're going to talk a little bit. All right. Okay. So tonight, these are some of the, the topics that we're going to be discussing. Okay. Like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about what is diabetes, um, prevention of diabetes, the different types of diabetes. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on these topics, but I think you have to have some of the foundation. Um, 
to these, um, you know, to, to diabetes in order to kind of move forward so we can talk about controlling blood sugars, okay? How diabetes is diagnosed and the important role that testing your blood sugar or knowing your numbers, physical activity, and you see in that big print right there, food. Uh -huh, look at that. And how all of these play a role in controlling blood sugars, okay? So let's spend some time first. Let's talk about what is diabetes? Well, diabetes is a, is a disease, it's a chronic disease, and it's where the pancreas, it's where the pancreas either does not make enough insulin or the insulin that it's making, it, it, it isn't able to use it properly. If you've heard the term insulin resistance, which is what we typically see in type two, that's where the, the body is making it, it just can't use it properly. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight as well, and how to get our body to use insulin a little bit better, okay? So there are actually, right now, three different types of diabetes that are recognized, and there's some discussion about some labeling some other types of diabetes. But the three types are type one, which used to be called juvenile onset diabetes. Uh, it's an autoimmune disorder and it is typically diagnosed in the, in the younger years, you hear children being diagnosed. But we are seeing it being diagnosed you know, later in years, okay? There's gestational diabetes, and that occurs when a woman is pregnant. Um, if any of the ladies have ever had gestational diabetes, it does create a risk factor for developing type two down the road, okay? And that's really all I'm gonna say about type one and gestational. Uh, type two is what they used to call adult onset diabetes, uh, but we are seeing younger and younger people diagnosed with, with type two as well. We're seeing adolescents diagnosed with this. We're seeing nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds diagnosed with type two diabetes, which is a very adult diet condition. Um, but type two and the prevention and managing blood sugars without medication, that's what we're gonna talk about type two. Someone with type one diabetes, they are on insulin because their pancreas does not make insulin for them, okay? So keep that in mind tonight as, as we're talking a little bit. All right, now back to the pancreas and what the, and what the uh, insulin does. So if you see in this picture, insulin is the key. So <coughs> insulin really has a job, and its job is to get the blood sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells. The cells then transport the glucose to different parts of the body. Our body does need some blood glucose. Our brains need it to function. They've done studies where, um, especially in teenagers, where you know kids don't eat before they go to school, and you know their brains aren't functioning, and that of course can have to do you know with blood sugar. But our muscles need glucose as well to function. So it all has a purpose. But think of insulin as the key that unlocks the door, so the the blood sugar can get to the cells. You go, okay, well. All right, where do we get blood sugar from? Well, carbohydrates. And, um, and again, John's gonna spend some time, a considerable amount of time tonight, talking about where carbohydrates um, are labeled, um, how our body kind of uses them, those kind of things, okay? And the liver, the liver also produces blood sugar. So if you go long time periods without feeding your body um, on purpose or overnight, your body does produce blood sugar, okay? So, you know, people say, well, I only eat one meal a day, okay? Well, nobody says that you have to eat a five-course meal at every meal, but maybe a little something spread throughout the day, like a, I'm just gonna say a yogurt in the morning, a lot of people don't like breakfast. You know, you just kinda wanna eat something, a piece of fruit, a little protein, just kind of space throughout the day, so you're not just eating one meal a day. And I think, John, you'll probably talk, us, talk to us about balancing meals and such. Yeah. Okay. So, just to reemphasize, insulin is the key that unlocks the door, 
to get the blood sugar to the cells, which can then be transported through the body. Okay. <coughs> or above, but, that, but that's Medicare standards. And then you go, well, I just have diabetes a little bit. <laughs> you don't. You have diabetes. Okay? But, and we're going to focus a little bit more on pre-diabetes as well. If you go to, let's say you have lab work done and your blood sugar is 103, that's categorized as pre-diabetes. 100% of the research out there if you fall in that pre-diabetes category, now is the time to really start making some lifestyle changes, okay? Lifestyle changes are very important at this stage. If, you're, if you don't make any changes now, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, you will trend into type 2 diabetes. That is 100% <coughs> excuse me, down the road, 5 or 10 years. That also, let's come down here to the hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is basically a 90-day average of your blood sugars. So the average lifespan of a red blood cell is about 90 to 120 days. Sugar is sticky. When it gets inside your blood, it, stick, it gets thick and it sticks to your red blood cells. So, so what they're looking at is the weight or the heaviness on your red blood cells when they're measuring. Again, standards say if you're about 5%, you're not diagnosed. If you are between 5.7 and 6.4%, that is considered pre-diabetes. 6.5% or above, you are diagnosed with diabetes. And again, these are numbers for people who are not diagnosed with diabetes. If, you're, if someone is already diagnosed with diabetes, these these numbers change a little bit as far as the hemoglobin A1C and the recommendations, okay? Possibly you could have also had an oral glucose tolerance test. That's where you have to drink the yummy orange stuff. It is 75 grams of a carbohydrate, and then they draw your blood. They're measuring it. Um, less than 140, normal. 140 to 199, you're considered prediabetes. 200 or higher, again, that's considered uh, diabetes. So when we're talking about tonight, when we're spending some time focusing on managing blood sugars without medications, we're kind of in that pre-diabetes category, but also for those who are already diagnosed with diabetes, you want to be able to do everything in your power, what you have control over, to manage those blood sugars and then we still may have to use some medications, but maybe we can use a lower dose, or maybe we only have to use one medication to help manage blood sugars. And even though sometimes we don't think we have control, we do have control over what goes in our mouth. We may argue with ourselves as it's approaching our mouth, but we, but we do have control over that. Okay. Um, the reason we focus so much on numbers uh, in, the, in the diabetes world we do, we focus on numbers all the time. High blood sugars can create health complications. And you're at a greater risk for eye complications. You're at a greater risk for heart complications.
kidney concerns, um, circulation issues, vascular. Um, so that's the reason we're going to spend some time talking about um, you know prevention and, and of course managing um, blood sugars. So I'm going to turn the program over now to Ashley, who is going to spend some time sharing some statistics about diabetes and pre-diabetes and the importance <clears throat> of trying to get this under control. And then John is the highlight of the night because he's going to talk about food and physical activity. So, so excuse us for a minute while we transfer these microphones. the button down until it comes on, Ashley. that 
you know, maybe those numbers are just a little bit high, or maybe those are the times where you're thinking, well, it was just a couple of points over. Nine out of 10 people that actually have prediabetes do not know that they have it. So that's almost everybody, you know, that if you think about 20 people that all have prediabetes, only two people actually know that. So, if you have prediabetes, or if you've been told that your blood sugar numbers are on the higher side, then, you know, some things that you can do to prevent or delay um, developing type 2 diabetes, you can try to lose weight through planned uh, weight loss, which includes healthy eating and getting physical activity as you're able. Um, as you're able to change your eating and increase your activity, you can cut your risk for getting type 2 diabetes in half, just with changes that you're able to make. Um, and John's going to go more into that here in just a minute. Um, and then just below it talks about some other risk factors, um, you know, like we had mentioned being overweight, being physically inactive, having a family history of diabetes, and being aged 45 or older. So some of those things we can't change. We can't change who our family is and if our parents or grandparents got diabetes. And we can change the fact that we're all getting older every day. So if you're 45 or older, we can't change that either. <coughs> but the things that we can change, what we're eating and how much activity no. we're getting. Okay. And so I'm going to turn that over to John, and he's going to talk a little bit more about those things. <coughs> So, like Ashley said, there are some things that we can do, uh, especially to help control our blood sugar to prevent that type 2 diabetes from happening. Um, and one of the most important things is our diet and what we, uh, what we choose to eat. And so, our carbohydrate foods, as Teresa touched on earlier, those are our main focus especially because those carbohydrate foods, and those include starches, sugar, and fiber are our main types. Those carbohydrate foods all break down into simpler carbohydrates and sugars, and that's where we get a lot of our blood sugar from. Um, some of those food sources that are listed up here um, include breads, cereals, grains, beans, and pasta, uh, fruit and fruit juices, milk, yogurt, ice cream, different dairy products, um, starchy vegetables like potatoes, peas, and corn, and then our sweets and desserts, of course. Um, and it's not that we can't have these have these different foods, but we definitely have to watch the portion size. That's important. Also, choosing our healthier sources of carbohydrates. So on the right here, you can see uh, on the top section, those are what we call our complex carbohydrates. So those foods like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, those are things that have more fiber in them versus our simple carbohydrates like white bread, um, sugary cereals, regular soda, candy. Um, those are things that uh, they get digested a little bit quicker so they can affect our blood sugar a lot quicker versus those complex carbohydrates that have more fiber. Those take longer to break down in our stomach. Um, they still will affect your blood sugar, but it'll be a little bit more delayed and hopefully not as high of a blood sugar spike after eating them. So we still have to watch portion sizes, but 
choosing those healthier carbohydrates is important. Um, another thing that we don't normally think about is you know, our beverage choices and what we choose to drink throughout the day because that could be a source of carbohydrates or sugar for some people. Um, now of course, water is our best choice to have throughout the day, but that gets boring. Um, so it, it is good to add variety, but make sure that you're choosing lower calorie, ideally no added sugars within that. So there's just a couple examples up here, like on the far right, there's the, the bubbly drinks or sparkling water. It's like a carbonated flavored water drink, zero sugar. Um, the Gatorade, zero sugar is one. Um, the different flavor packets that you can add to water, like Crystal Light, or that's the Great Value brand that's sugar-free, um, or fat-free skim milk, which is dairy, so it does have some carbohydrates, but it also has protein and other nutrients that you're not going to get from uh, other drinks, maybe. Um, also, unsweetened tea or coffee could also be good options as well. So just being mindful of our drink choices, too, is important. How many carbs should I eat? Um, well, so that depends on a lot of things, but we measure our carbohydrates in grams, and that's what we have on our food label. Uh, we consider one carb serving or carb choice is about 15 grams. And for the average adult, um, for women, on average, uh, three to four servings, or 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrates per meal would be within a healthy range. And for men, uh, four to five carb servings, or uh, 60 to 75 grams per meal, that's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you have three meals a day, or you could split that up a lot of different ways through snacks and stuff too. Um, because we know nutrition's not a a one-size-fits-all uh, answer. Um, a lot of these, you know, recommendations will vary depending on your age, your gender, your weight, your height, physical activity level throughout the day. So just keep that in mind. Um, but you know, you don't necessarily have to count carbs and you know keep track of every gram to still have a healthy diet. So there's what's called this diabetes portion plate, or it's called the plate method, where you fill your plate based on including a variety of different food groups, and you can see the different portion sizes that are included with each food group. Um, so you can see right away, half your plate is those vegetables, ideally non-starchy vegetables, like <coughs> broccoli up there, or green beans, peppers, zucchini, um, carrots, um, then we have our, our starches, grains in the top right quarter of our plate. And then our proteins in the bottom right hand corner, which could be meat, could also be uh, vegetarian protein sources like nuts, beans, uh, soy, a lot of different things there. Um, and then also it includes a small portion size of fruit and also a small portion of dairy too. So I'm going to transition over here because I've got some different uh, food models that I wanted to show you guys. And keep in mind too that this is based off of a nine inch dinner plate. So this is our ideal size of our plate. Um, but so for this food, two thirds of a cup and you got to have your measuring cups to uh, kind of visualize it. Here's one third flat across the top, and in that portion of food, it tells us our, everything that's within our food. And there's calories up there, but we also look at, of course, our total carbohydrates, and the fiber and the sugars that's included in that total amount. Um, so keep that in mind also. So I always tell people just to focus on that total carbohydrates. Um, now there is where you can if a food has more than four or five grams of fiber per serving, technically you could take half of that fiber, subtract it from the total carbohydrates, and give yourself a net carb amount that your body's really going to digest, but it just gets a little confusing. 
So just sticking with the total carbohydrates is good. And so you can pick up different products uh, in the store and compare which one has more or less carbohydrates. I've got some good examples up here too that you guys can look at later on too. Um, so now I'm gonna to touch on a little bit about physical activity, how that helps. Um, so physical activity, the more active you are throughout the day, the more your muscles are gonna use that sugar for energy, because remember that's our muscle, uh, our brain, our, all our organs, that's our major fuel source. So if you're burning more of that fuel, it's gonna help keep your blood sugars in a healthy range. Just some other benefits listed here to physical activity, uh, improved energy levels, improved quality of sleep, um, it also helps to strengthen your heart, lungs, and increases muscle tone. And you also, it can help you to achieve and maintain a healthy weight, which we know that's a risk factor that we can <coughs> modify to prevent diabetes. So a lot of different benefits. Um, now the key recommendations for adults um, are listed here at the top. So. Our ideal goal is 150 minutes spread throughout the week, moderate intensity aerobic activity, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, moderate intensity, or uh, 75 minutes per week of vigorous uh, aerobic activity. And I'll talk about that as well, but ideally kind of spacing that throughout the week is what's shown to be most beneficial. So if you're focusing on the 150 minutes a week, you could do 30 minutes a day, five days a week, or you could break that up into smaller chunks more often throughout the week and still get a lot of those benefits. Um, even if you're not physically active, not exercising, just spending less time sitting and uh, focusing on more light intensity activity is helpful too. Um, but you know, if you're planning to start exercising, it's important also to I think start slow and kind of increase that intensity or how often you exercise uh, gradually over time so you don't overdo it. Also, if you have any other specific health issues, uh, we may need to talk with your healthcare provider too to come up with a good plan to make sure it's safe for you. So, um, now this is a good um, picture here because it kind of gives you an idea of what when I was talking about earlier about intensity level of exercise, so there's actually a, it's called the rate of perceived exertion scale between one and 10. And so one is very light activity, 10 is like maximum effort. Um, so between two to three and four to six, that's the light to moderate physical activity level, that blue and green section there. So that's kind of where we want to focus on. You can see light activity is where it feels like you can maintain that for a long period of time, easy to breathe and carry on a conversation while you're doing it. When you get to the more moderate activity, um, your breathing might become a little more heavily uh, breathing. Maybe you can hold a short conversation, um, still somewhat comfortable, but maybe becoming a little more noticeably challenging. So that's kind of the range I think that would be good to focus on. Um, no, definitely starting with more of the light activity if you're not used to exercising regularly. But if you're more well trained, maybe that's too easy for you. You can up that a little bit gradually over time. So um, I think Ashley is going to talk a little bit next about some of the differences. Okay, so up here on the screen, you can see the differences, um, kind of some of the symptoms for high blood sugars and low blood sugars. So um, over here on the left-hand side, 
is some of the symptoms you might notice uh, if you're having a higher blood sugar. These might also be good signs and symptoms to watch for for anyone who um, is maybe thinking that they might have some you know, abnormal blood sugar levels. These symptoms are indicators of prediabetes or a diagnosis of diabetes. So if, you know, sometimes your healthcare provider might ask you, you know, have you been really thirsty lately? Have you been urinating more frequently? Um, those are probably two of the most common symptoms. Uh, sometimes people will notice some blurry vision or, you know, irregularity in their vision. Um, some other symptoms that are noted up there, um, you might have an increase in hunger or appetite. You could also feel very sleepy when your blood sugars are elevated. Um, you know, kind of thinking about that when you're eating too much and you kind of go into that food coma sleepy state. Um, this would be kind of towards that type of feeling that just fatigue feeling. Um, and it could also be uh, infections or injuries, cuts, scrapes, uh, new infections, things that are not healing properly. So those are all indicators that you could be having higher blood sugar numbers. Over here on the right hand side is the symptoms of a blood sugar that would be too low. So typically, we would see these symptoms for somebody who is already diagnosed with diabetes, and most likely they would be taking some sort of diabetes medication. Um, so if that applies to anyone in this room or anyone you know, um, these are good signs and symptoms to watch for. Um, so if someone is having a blood sugar that's too low, that would be a blood sugar reading of under 70. That person may start feeling shaky or break out into a sweat without doing any extra activity to cause that sweat. Um, they might feel dizzy, not be able to walk straight um, or confused. They might. They might, the person may not know that they're confused, but they may, you know, if you're talking to them, they may sound like they're not making sense to you. Um, they could have an increased appetite, um, feeling hungry or a fast heartbeat or feeling kind of nervous or anxious. Um, so those are some of the symptoms to watch for if your blood sugar is too low. Um, so now that we know what to watch for, then let's talk about what we can do to correct them. Um, so again, high blood sugar uh, over on the left side. Um, if you notice that your numbers are too high, if you are already diagnosed with diabetes and those numbers are too high, um, <laughs> What you can do, of course, if you're taking uh, any type of medication for diabetes, make sure that you are taking it as prescribed. Um, other things you can do, you can try to increase your physical activity as you're able. So if you were to see a high blood sugar result, you can try to go take a walk or do some other type of activity. Because as John just said, that activity will help to lower your blood sugar numbers. Um, and then also drinking plenty of water if your blood sugar is high, that will also help to, uh, you know, start to decrease those levels. Um, <clears throat> if you're, um, oh, and I should also say with a high blood sugar, it just takes time. So if you're, you know, you see a high number, you're trying to increase your activity, you're drinking extra water, you're doing everything that you can do, know that it's still gonna take a little while for that number to come down. It's not gonna be an immediate fix. Um, so just keep monitoring it and making sure that it is trending down and into the right direction. Um, 
over on this side talks about the treatment for a low blood sugar. Um, so as we mentioned before, if you yourself or someone you know is all of a sudden shaky or sweaty, confused, um, <clears throat> if that blood sugar is under 70 or they are having those symptoms, um, then you should treat it as a low blood sugar. So the way to treat that, we use what we call the 15 rule, the 1515 rule. Um, so that would be eating or drinking 15 grams of fast acting carbohydrate, which could be four ounces of regular juice, could be any flavor juice. It could be four ounces of regular soda, any flavor soda, as long as it's not diet. Um, it could be, you know, four glucose tablets. Um, so as long as you're getting something that is getting, it, most of its carbohydrates are coming from sugar, and you're getting about 15 grams into your system to increase that blood sugar quickly. Um, once you've, you know, say drink four ounces of juice, we want you to wait about 15 minutes and then check it again to make sure that that number has come up to a safe range. Um, and then, um, you know, depending on the time of day and how you're feeling, you may also want to follow that up with maybe a small snack or a meal to make sure that that blood sugar is stabilized. Um, so, just some <coughs> additional uh, resources. Um, that we have listed here. Um, if you want to do any extra, you know, uh, research on your own, uh, the American Diabetes Association is up there at the top. Their website is a wealth of knowledge um, with everything from exercises to recipes um, to um, just overall information on diabetes and pre-diabetes and um, just lots of interesting stuff, um, and that is diabetes.org. Um, the American Heart Association is up there, and they can um, they have different uh, ideas on exercises, and along with uh, blood pressure um, parameters, if anyone is interested in that. Um, there are some uh, websites up there that can help with recipes if you're wondering about what to cook or how to modify recipes to make them more healthy. Um, and then also MyFitnessPal um, is a free app um, for Apple and Android phones. And it's just a fitness and food tracker that can help you, you know, keep track of what you're eating, how much you're eating, your portion sizes, um, you know, if you're starting to count carbohydrates, it can help with all of that. Um, as well as uh, Calorie King, which the book is pictured up here. Um, we, uh, at the Diabetes Center, we really like the Calorie King because it has pretty much every, any food you can think of, almost any restaurant, any type of food. Um, and it lists the calorie value, the carbohydrate value, and the fat content of all of those foods. Um, there's a whole section for restaurants in there as well. Um, you know, so say if you were going to McDonald's and you wanted to look up what would be the best option there, it would probably be in that book. Um, and they also have a app for your phone as well. Um, so just some different resources to look into. Um, Ashley, before I go to questions, I, I just, can I just add one thing? Sure. <laughs> so before we go to questions, I just kind of want to tie things up a little bit. So our presentation tonight was, the main focus was controlling blood sugars without medications, right? So if you notice, we really focused on physical activity, right? 
And physical activity is what your body can do, and knowing what you're putting in your mouth as far as food goes. Because sometimes what we think we eat and what we actually eat can be two different things. So just making yourself more aware of the carbohydrates, spacing your food you know, out throughout the day can help just by keeping, you know, keeping things even. And you know, we're not standing up here saying that you need to be a marathon runner, okay? But walking is one of the cheapest forms of activity, you know, if your body allows you to do that, swimming, um, bicycling, you know, whatever works. So that's really the main focus when we talk about without medications. And again, just to emphasize, if someone is on medications, we still want to focus on food, meal planning, and physical activity. Okay. So we'll go to questions, and we'd be more than happy to to answer. Do you want to? Do you want me to leave this on, or? No, I think we can hear when there's talking okay. out here. That's good. Thanks, Teresa. And again, thank you all so much for yeah. for coming tonight. We could talk about diabetes and food and all that for hours. We could me. talk about food for hours. Yeah, we, yes. yeah. We're we're um, we've been doing this a while. Yeah. This is kind of our passion. So, all right, what you got? Okay. I have a question. How does salt figure in on all this? Oh, great question. Well, so salt <laughs> has sodium, and sodium <laughs> is something that can affect our blood pressure. So if we have too much of it in our diet, it can raise our blood pressure. So watching how much of our sodium we get through the foods we eat, the salt that we add to foods, that's important. And that's always on our food label, too. Uh, ideally, how, how many milligrams of sodium do we need? About 2,000 milligrams a day would be good. But just how does that affect diabetes? How does it affect diabetes? Well, we want to try to manage our blood pressure with diabetes, right? Okay. And maybe Teresa could add why that's such an important thing. Okay, so if we're if our blood pressure is elevated, then of course our kidneys can be affected, right? I, I'm sure you, you've heard this from your provider. Well, what else affects kidneys? High blood sugars over time, okay? Plus, high blood pressure creates what kind of, what organ is gonna be strained? the heart. If someone has diabetes, they already have a 50% greater risk factor for developing a heart disease, heart condition. So that would be my explanation why it's so important to, you know, look at blood pressure and look at all factors that, that kind of figure into that. Okay. You don't want to damage kidneys and strain on your heart and those kind of situations. So. <coughs> Anyone else? What's a recommend blood pressure for a person with diabetes? Uh, it, it really doesn't change as far as if someone has diabetes or not. Um, cool. I want to say the American Heart uh, Association right now recommends. I was going to say 120 over But then I've heard 130 over 80 well, is okay too, but that's why we're laughing. So, Recommended is 120 over 80. That's the latest knowledge that's coming forward in, in my brain. However, um, you know, maybe your provider says, I'm okay with, you know, a 130 over, you know, 82 or, but, you know, those are, those are recommendations. And it doesn't matter if you have diabetes. It's, that's just heart healthy for everyone. Yeah, but, um, artificial sweeteners. Oh, good question. Yeah, it's definitely something that I think is good to limit because we don't know long term how that affects people. Um, so I think a general rule that I like to tell people is just to treat it like you would regular sugar, use less of it. But it's definitely better to use that instead of real sugar if we're trying to control our blood sugar because those artificial sweeteners or sugar substitutes aren't going to affect your blood sugar at all. So, but it is something I think to be mindful of and um, depending on what type of food it is, it makes a difference too. It's like a diet soda and uh, so well, soda a day would be an ideal goal to stay well.
Well, that's good, so you don't have to worry about that. But you know, just being mindful of how much you're having too. Like, versus, well, diet soda doesn't affect my blood sugar, so I can drink a 12 pack a day. That's probably not good, right? So, yeah. Or, or I have one glass of diet soda a day, but it's the 48 ounce glass, you know, cup from. Yeah. <laughs> Moderation for everything. Yes, and I mean, so. you will never hear any of us say, oh my gosh, you can never eat cookies again. Moderation, right? Instead of eating a whole pack, maybe just one cookie. Is there a better artificial sweetener that you recommend? I like Stevia. Splenda or Stevia. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Stevia is plant. Stevia is more plant. Well, it comes from a Stevia plant, and they process it somehow, but <coughs> supposedly more natural. Mm -hmm. Splenda is like chlorinated sugar. They add a chlorine atom to it. Is that good? <laughs> well, it's... <laughs> It don't sound good to me. <laughs> it's, your body doesn't digest it as well, so it just kind of goes through us and doesn't get absorbed as well. So, yeah, I saw a question back there. Um, my new AARP magazine that I received yesterday suggested that um, when you eat within a 10 hour window, that that is has been shown to control blood sugar. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, there is some good research out there. Um, it's it's like time restricted eating is what that's called. Is where you, you eat within about a 10, 12 hour window during the day while you're awake. Um, the you know the theory behind that is your body is gonna is more metabolically active while you're awake versus our sleep cycle. As it gets later in the day, your body starts to get ready for sleep, and so your different hormones and things are not as active for <coughs> digestion process and stuff. So eating within a smaller amount of window versus eating late at night, that can be a good thing. Yeah, you can also help with cholesterol and different things. They also suggested an afternoon walk versus morning. I think physical activity is great at any time of the day, um, aside from maybe late at night, because if you were to exercise late at night, you might not be able to sleep. Um, but yeah, afternoon, morning is pretty good. After a meal would be good too, to help control blood sugars. So. Where's a good source of information about portion sizes? What's that? A good source of information, a um, visual so that or Portion sizes. Um, the, well, the American Diabetes Association, definitely. Um, in your bag, too, there's some good, well, you know, the big, our, the healthy balance plate is good. Um, I do have some other made outside of with, yeah, that one right there. So, nine inch dinner plate and the different portion sizes. Um, you can take a look at, at this up here too if it's helpful. Um, I also have another handout that didn't get put in the bags that it's similar to uh, the one that I showed after that tells you like half a cup of this, one cup is a serving. So I can give you that too. That's helpful. But um, definitely check out the Diabetes website if you can um, because they have a lot more information on it. Sizes and, stuff too. and I don't know if it'll help, but remember John talked about the recommended amount of like carbohydrates for women versus men per meal. So if you look at 30 to 45 grams of a carbohydrate, then knowing the serving sizes um, and how to build, you know, that plate. So. <coughs> You know, let's say you're going to, let's say you're gonna have a cheeseburger, okay, or a hamburger. We're gonna have a grilled hamburger. And, um, and we're gonna, and um, are we gonna use a bun? No. Okay, maybe, or depends on what I'm gonna eat with it, right? So, if we look at the hamburger and the bun, what part of that meal is the carbohydrate? 
bun. The bun, uh -huh. right? Okay. So you have a top and a bottom, typically a standard bun. The top is 15 and the bottom is 15. So there's 30. Okay. Not true. Well, hamburger with a bun may not fill me up. Or I'm not going to eat the bun. So I'm going to have a hamburger. I'm going to have a salad with it. I want 30 to 45 grams of carbs. What could I add? So I could add a fruit, right? I could add a fruit. So, so in each, like, the, from the grain section here, fruit, the milk, dairy, those are each, like, an example of about 15 grams of carbs each. Like it says, one slice of bread, regular bread, or one small fruit. Um, like 15 grapes, a small apple, half a banana, those are all 15 gram servings. Half a cup of fruit juice, those are all 15 gram The one that's going around right now, that's kind of like what this is. Well, yeah, so this is 15 grams. That's about 15 grams, so it's about half a cup. Um, I know green grapes have slightly less carbs. Not Thank you very much. A couple grams difference. So, yeah. But yeah, you do have to be careful with fruits in general. And I, I would say fruits, like, as you can see, like, the portion size is a little bit different, too. Okay. measuring things that you already have in your cupboard or pantry, just measuring them out, counting out, you know, five crackers, or, and knowing that that's one serving, or taking your, you know, box of cereal and saying, okay, this, this is one cup, and this is one serving, and, how much am I actually eating every morning? Am I eating one cup or am I eating maybe one and a half or two cups or, you know, some of those foods are kind of tricky compared to what the label says is a serving size from what we're actually eating as what we think our serving is. So. And you know, I think that's where keeping a food diary too is a really good thing to practice. You don't have to do it forever, but you can write down what you eat throughout the day and measure it and exactly how much it is and try to figure out well, how many carbs Anna am I getting throughout the day or everything. We haven't even touched on when you go out. Oh, uh, I was going to say, how about when you go out? Really big place. Yes, you ask for a doggy bag at the beginning and you can push it.